organizers for the invitation uh, for organizing this meeting and thank you for coming uh, on Monday morning. So I'm going to talk about Hilbert cubes and arithmetic sets and arithmetic sets are typically sets you will see later which have some multiplicative definitions. So Hilbert cubes are a question from coming from additive combinatorics and the questions we study is mainly the set of squares or a set of powerful numbers and similar sets. So this is, uh, most of this is joint work with uh, Rainer Dietmann. So we have a joint paper which already appeared. Uh, and we have a second paper which, uh, part of it is on the archive and this uh, extended version has been submitted recently. And uh, some, some further part you will see in the talk is joint work with Andre de Jella. So what is a Hilbert cube? So if you just look at the first line and just understand this as an iterated sum set, so if there's a set with, with two integers, that means you can take any of the two. So here you have, well, five, you know, choice, but then you have a choice of two elements, a choice of another two elements, and the third choice. So you have kind of eight possible ways to choose uh, a set, and, and the, uh, this gives a set of eight, in this case, distinct integers. But generally, these sums can do not have to be distinct. So generally, uh, uh, you get two to the d formally formal sums, but some of them could fall together. So here you get eight distinct integers, and you see that example happens to create primes. Of course, that's the way how I constructed it. So generally, uh, you think of a Hilbert cube as one shift, a zero is an uh, affine shift, and then you have d base elements and so, um, so you have uh, then it, to make a choice. Either you take the set a, uh, the element a i, or you don't take it. You take zero or a i. So you get formally two to the d many sums. Not all of them are distinct. And uh, uh, an important special case, of course, is the case a zero equals zero. So this then is just called subset sums. So Hilbert cubes is kind of a generalization of subset sums. So if you want to study a particular set S and want to understand the additive structure, it's quite natural to ask, uh, does the set contain Hilbert cubes or does it contain large Hilbert cubes, large meaning with high dimension D? Um, and there could be further motivation coming from very different areas. So, I mean, uh, the Gauss norm, which we don't need here, uh, just to say uh, it evaluates the function F at the values of a Hilbert cube, and it's, of course, closely related to arithmetic progressions, which we also will use later, but otherwise we don't use the Gower norm. Or a very different application could come from the complexity of a sequence if you want to study a sequence S. And suppose you find a very large Hilbert cube inside, that would mean you have just uh, used, say, D base elements, and you can actually describe or uh, define in this way the two to the d many, many uh, subset sums. So that would be a very great compression algorithm if you would find for a random set these AIs. So a few words uh, about the history. Uh, well, Hilbert, uh, in a paper on polynomials, had a more combinatorial lemma. It was one of the uh, Ramsey-type uh, results, a uh, very early Ramsey-type argument. So uh, if you have two parameters are, think of it as the colors, the number of colors, uh, and d, the dimension of the cube you want, and th there is a finite um, h, depending on d and r, so that if you color this interval from 1 to this h with these r colors, uh, then in one of the colors you find a d-dimensional Hilbert cube. And uh, if you look at Samaradi's proof on uh, Kth pro uh, arithmetic, a set of positive density has long progressions or progressions of length four or, or longer, then you find a so-called cube lemma hidden there. So this says, um, if you have a set S in the interval from one to N with that many N to the one minus one over two to the D many elements, then S contains 
um, an affine d-dimensional Hilbert cube. So that's a much stronger result than Hilbert's because it just means it, it's not in one of the colors you find this, but you find it in all colors which have at least many elements. So that's called a density version. In particular, as a corollary, uh, because of this counting function over there, one n to the 1 minus 1 over 2 to the d, you can work out, suppose s has positive density or a lower density, then the, you find a Hilbert cube of an arbitrary dimension, and the dimension even increases double logarithmically uh, to infinity. So we are mainly concerned with the set of squares, but let's just give an example for uh, primes. So I gave a small example before, but what is known about the dimension? So uh, Hege, Vary, and Shakusi proved an upper bound on the possible dimension of a Hilbert cube and the set of primes. So we always work in finite intervals from 1 to n, so, and then this upper bound is of logarithmic size, log n, and uh, Alan Wood and myself, we independently had a, an improvement on this, log n over log log n. Um, this is, of course, a small improvement, but we think of d as the dimension, and so a small improvement in the dimension in the exponent, so to say, uh, could have some effects. And actually, Alan Wood, uh, who is an expert in logic, um, had some motivation coming from this complexity theory. And he says this, this says something about the complexity of the set of primes, uh, this, this small improvement from log n over log log n. So let's talk about squares. Before we come to Hilbert cubes, let's talk about easier sum sets in the squares. Let's uh, actually give first a very small example. So it's, it seems to be difficult to find larger examples. I have one larger example. Uh, uh, but not, it's not still not impressive. And if you ask a slightly different question about not just Hilbert cubes, but if you st study some sets, so can you find a large set A so that all the elements of the sum set A plus A or all distinct elements of A plus A are square, then the largest that is known uh, has size 6, and you see there's one negative number, so uh, even a positive number size 5 seems to be the optimum that is currently known, and nobody knows what's the truth. So that already seems to be a difficult question to find large sets. And if you now relax the question, not A plus A, but if you study uh, two distinct sets, A plus B is a subset of the squares. Uh, so we uh, uh, give you some ideas what's true or not true. Uh, so let's study for the moment if A has just two elements. What can we say on the size B? So just ask this yourself. A has two elements. What can you say on the size B? The question could be, well, it's finite or possibly infinite as possible, or um, it could be that it's bounded for any given A, it's bounded, but still, if you chase, choose, choose another A, it could tend to infinity, it could be, tend to arbitrarily large size. And actually, this is what happens. So, this is quite easy to analyze. So, just take two elements, A1 and A2, you shift them by some BI. Uh, so, uh, one gives x squared, the other one gives y squared. You take the difference, A2 minus A1. This is a difference of squares, which you can factor. And actually, each of these factorizations, um, produces you um, uh, an element bi. So just um, if you fix a number a2 minus a1, which has many prime factors, say if it has s prime factors, then it has 2 to the s many uh, factorizations. And I've just made an example uh, with, say, four prime factors. a2 minus a1 is a product of four small primes. So you have actually 16 factorizations, but say if you order them, one of y is larger, you have eight useful factorizations. And um, so in this way, given a set A with, say, where a2 minus a1 has many prime factors, you get lots of factorizations, you get a large set B. And so how large can you get it? Well, that's a question now on the divisor function. Um, so the B can be as large as the divisor function allows you that is quite large, actually log n, exp of log n over log log n, that's as large as, can it, as it can be. And you can construct a sequence so that actually it, it becomes that large. So the answer is, given a set A, the set B will be a finite size, but it can be as large as you like it in, in the sense of this exp of log n over log log n. So what about if A has size 3? Um, it seems the question already is hidden in Euler's work, uh, as pointed out by Arlon and some co-authors, and they 
actually um, studied this, the related question and they found this, uh, there exists a set A with three elements so that um, you can find a set B with logarithmically many log n to some exponent 5 over 7 many elements. And what they actually did is they constructed an elliptic curve with certain properties uh, of high rank, which means here 5, and um, that gave the result. And actually, they were not interested in elliptic curves. That was just a tool for them. They were interested in applications to expanders. Um, so Andre Doyella and myself looked at this question again, and we uh, were uh, lucky to found uh, an elliptic curve with higher rank. So the rank would then be, in our case, 15. So, but the uh, framework would be the same. We get a size b uh, of logarithmic, just a better exponent. And also, we can get an extra condition on a and b. So a and b can additionally be prime, and the sum set a plus b is prime, and we still get a better exponent. But we do not know if there would be a, perhaps a very different construction uh, breaking this log n. Uh, actually, the elliptic curve we used for the last example looks like this. So um, uh, you might have guessed this anyway. But um, well, of course, we filtered a little bit for good curves of high rank. So let me actually ask about the upper bound as, a, as an open problem. Um, well, I told you if a has size 2, then uh, this expression is an upper bound. So if a has size 3, there should be a better upper bound. So that's my conjecture, just something better than uh, what you get for bound 2. Uh, I, 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 don't have a, I don't have a good guess what should be better. But there's a huge gap between the lower bound of essentially logarithmic size and this is what you get from the case a equals 2. So if a has size 4, uh, the, the landscape changes because uh, there a very strong conjecture by Bombier and Lang implies as a special case that uh, the set B is bounded in a stronger sense, just uniformly bounded. So if you fix the size of A, then there is a large, possibly large, finite number so that the size B does not tend to infinity with a nicer set A, but just is uniformly bounded. And the type of argument actually would be related to this elliptic curve question. It's just uh, you now have curves of higher genus, and there should be very few rational points. So this observation uh, is, is in work of Sholimochi and Celerello and uh, Granville. So now let's come to a Hilbert cube. So we just, we just studied some sets A plus B, and now we study iterated some sets, but now the Individual sets just have two elements, so we come to Hilbert cubes. So the question, what about Hilbert cubes and squares, goes back to uh, uh, Brown, Erdős, and Friedman, uh, but just as a question, not as a conjecture or whatever. They just asked, does it tend to infinity or is it finite or whatever? So the first result I'm aware of is by uh, Hege variant Sharkosi again, who proved an upper bound of uh, big O of log n to the one third. I tell you a little bit about the proof in a moment, but anyway, uh, in a sequence of work with uh, Rainer Dietmann, uh, we improved that and say the final third line is kind of logarithmically better than uh, the previous uh, authors and some previous results in between. And in, if you think in, uh, k powers instead of squares, we also get this log log n, but essentially for a different reason. So the type of proof is, is a bit special for the squares. So anyway, what should be true, uh, the answer should be finite. Uh, this was observed by Sholimochi, but it should be clear from the previous slide from this bombieri lang conjecture. Uh, if, if one of the sets has four elements, the other one is finite. So actually, that means you cannot construct in this finite set a large Hilbert cube. So let me briefly say uh, something about the approach of uh, Hegevary and Chakrasi. Um, they studied the question mainly modular primes and then used the SIF method to get the local information modular primes to a bound on the integer case. So if you study the question a plus b is a subset or uh, as a plus b is a subset of the uh, z modulo p and a plus b is a subset of the squares, uh, you can actually prove that one of the sets a or B is at most square root of P, so that is a uh, character sum argument. And 
also then you use a result of also in saying if you have modulo p, if you have this t distinct residue classes, and you take this uh, these subset sums, so this kind of uh, Hilbert cube, so you get at least uh, roughly t squared over two many residue classes. Now t squared over two should be by the previous line less than square root of p, so t is at most roughly uh, fourth root of p. And uh, then you take a SIF argument, and if the number of residue classes which are used by the set A is modulo many primes, only a fourth root of P, then a SIF method tells you uh, that for the integers, you get log n to the one third. Actually, let, let me say that uh, parts of the proof are best possible. So, uh, for example, this argument is also an argument here. If you try to take an, a long arithmetic progression of D elements, so actually you get a subset sums so roughly d squared over too many elements. So this part of the argument cannot be improved. But actually, if you look at the example, that's a long arithmetic progression. And if you would be able to say something like this doesn't happen, maybe you just can avoid this argument. Actually, in this situation with modulo p, we cannot avoid the argument because we do not know better about, say, the least non-square modular primes. So it's closely related. If we would now much better result about non-square modular primes, maybe we could improve that. But in a sense, this is the weakness of an argument, also the SIF method. So maybe we should avoid this. But we cannot in this situation. Um, but so not, let's just do a little, little bit of philosophy. What should we do? Uh, instead of studying this locally modular primes, I suggest we study it globally really in the integers because in the integers we know that arithmetic progressions in the set of squares are heavily restricted. So three progressions exist, but they are well understood. Four progressions in the set of squares do not exist. That's an observation by Fermat. So it's not, not the big Fermat theorem, it's just an uh, elementary observation. So what we, what we like to use is an argument like, uh, if you have a sum, let say, c plus d in a set with a certain property, like the squares, or as I said, in a set without four progressions, then one of the sets is small, and th this is an argument also used before, uh, then we can proceed. And, and similarly, if you have a set A where you know certain properties, whatever this is, uh, then the subset sums are kind of exponentially increasing, then we would have, uh, well, kind of improved this previous framework. So a lot of people, have, of course, uh, have worked on uh, arithmetic progressions. Uh, it's a, uh, yeah, Samaradi, Buga, Tao, and, and lots of people have worked on this. Also, uh, squares and arithmetic progression, there's some work. Uh, uh, also, if you study uh, case powers, uh, well, there are not even three progressions in the kth powers if k is at least three, so there is no tr non trivial solution to this. x to the k plus y to the k equals two times z to the k. This is essentially uh, as deep as Fermat's theorem, just with the coefficient two. And so if you study this type of thing, squares do not contain arithmetic progressions of length four, and if we do not study at modular primes, we have kind of avoided this, uh, what I just said, uh, this is the weak, uh, uh, maybe a weak situation in a pr the previous approaches. So actually what we use is a, a very nice and useful lemma by Katalin Guermati um, saying um, if so A and B is a subset of the integer from 1 to n, A plus B is a subset of the kth powers. Um, so for a fixed exponent k, for example, k equals 2, then one of the sets A or B is at size a constant times log n. That's a very useful argument which we use. Um, and let's just for the moment study the case of k equals 3, because here we know there are not even three progressions. So um, uh, in this situation, if you are on a set where uh, the subset sums or sums uh, do, do not even contain three progressions, you are uh, lucky because then all the 2 to the d subset sums are happen to be distinct. You can work that out. Suppose, suppose this is not the case. Suppose you have found two subset sums uh, which are uh, formally distinct but happen to fall together as an integer. You can work out from this. Then you can actually construct an arithmetic progression of length 3. And if that doesn't exist, you prove that you have 
all of the two to the d subset sums are distinct. And then what you choose to apply Guillermati's lemma, you say A is a set of, say, the Hilbert cube of the first d over two base elements with this additive shift, and B is the set of the second d over two base elements. And so you have in the set A and B two by the previous, they are all distinct, two to d over two many distinct elements. And by Guillermati's lemma, one of these sets is at least only logarithmically sized. So therefore, D, just take the logarithm in this, this line, therefore, D is of double logarithmic size. So that's very nice. For the set of kth powers, therefore, we get big O of log log n. And we hope for the set of squares, we can do it similarly. Uh, just, I mean, this, this lemma corresponding to Fermat's last theorem doesn't exist. Uh, it's a bit more complicated. We replace it by Fermat's lemma. There are no four progressions in the primes, uh, sorry, in the squares. Um, and th we have to work out what follows, what type of, um, uh, what's the size of the subset sums that we get. We would like to have exponential increase. So the first lemma we proved is if you take an h fold sum set, it's roughly of size cardinality of a to the h divided by h factorial. That's as good as you would hope, but then we have to divide by an extra h factorial and k to the h. So if h is fixed, it doesn't really matter, but if h is increasing, that weakens our exponential sum set growth. But anyway, uh, this type of sum set growth, lemma, would, as uh, just the same proof I just explained before, would give you an upper bound on the dimension of size of log log n squared. So, um, but when we and we proved that we were quite unhappy about, say, the weakness of this growth lemma. It's good, but not perfect. And actually, I, I asked Nuga Alon about this, uh, and he said, well, actually, what we proved somewhere in between is an arithmetic version of a lemma of Erdős and Arado. So uh, it's also called sunflower lemma. So a sunflower is if you have several sets which intersect where a pairwise intersection of any two of the sets uh, is the same. So what to say, the red and the yellow and the blue, whatever, they inter just, just intersect in the square. And the Adorado sunflower lemma says, if you have a family of sets of the same size s, and if your family is as large as uh, this s factorial times roughly k to the s, uh, then F contains such a sunflower with K petals, and that's kind of a combinatorial version of that, what we actually use to say certain uh, subset sums are distinct, but uh, Alan said, well, don't worry, because, you know, there's this $1,000 conjecture saying uh, you could actually improve this bound to a constant to the, to the S. So then you would actually get what you want, this double logarithmic bound. So now, well, you have a choice to make. What do you do? So either you say that's the end of the story, or you prove this $1,000 conjecture, or you do something else, and that's what we did. Um, so, we proved a better cross lemma, and uh, actually we uh, got some inspiration in a, in a recent paper by Thomas Schön. So, um, if S does not contain an arithmetic progression of length k, uh, then we prove there is a constant c which is larger than 1, that's all we need. Uh, uh, it can be roughly as large as 1 plus 1 over k, um, then actually if you take this, D-dimensional Hilbert cube, you get uh, an exponential increase. That's what we want. So don't worry exactly about the constants, so but just a constant larger than one to the d is what we want. And it's an immediate application, actually, just for the set of k uh, for, for for sets S without k progression, we immediately get an upper bound using this of size d. Uh, d is less than a constant times log n. It's only log, but that's in this for this question, it's best possible apart from the constant. So for this question, S doesn't contain k progressions. Uh, log n times a constant is uh, the best you can do. One can construct examples. But anyway, uh, coming to the Hilbert cubes and the squares now is, is really kind of, now having said all this, it's really now straightforward. So by far more, uh, the squares do not contain four progressions by uh, Guillermati's lemma. You, I mean, you can split the Hilbert cube in, in, in two parts, and one of the parts is only of logarithmic size, and because the sets A are, in our application, a Hilbert cube of size d over 2, um, 
you get a C to some ex exponent like D uh, is less than logarithmic of n, so D is double logarithmic in n. So now, now the proof is, is really simple. So, I mean, I think the framework of the proof, avoiding the progressions, uh, sorry, uh, avoiding this question modulo p, but using uh, this global property of there are no arithmetic progressions, uh, helped a lot. So, as I said, this, uh, yeah. So now let's uh, make a few further comments. So we studied the set of squares, but they are related sets. So let's study the so-called powerful numbers. So a number is powerful if for any prime dividing n, also p squared divides n. So uh, in this situation, we can uh, prove um, a logarithmic bound d is less than log n squared. Well, that actually is an improvement on uh, a result by Guillermati, Schakosi, and Stewart, who proved in the special case of subset sums um, log n to the cube divided by something small. And actually, in this situation, also the truth is of logarithmic size. We just do not exactly know the exponent, so they can construct a lower bound of square log n. Uh, but they only were interested in subset sums, and uh, in for this type of question, very often it's not exactly similar. Is it almost the same? A Hilbert cube is more general, but is it kind of an easy adjustment or is it a deeper adjustment? So um, we, we studied in the Hilbert cube, and we show you in a later slide uh, there could be a huge difference in the two questions, namely on uh, pure powers. So just uh, the exponent is at least two and the base is at least two. So what's the largest size of a uh, Hilbert cube in pure powers? Again, the answer is log n squared, and if you, in this situation, study subset sums instead, um, actually you get uh, double logarithmic uh, log, log n to the cube divided by something small. So in this situation, the subset sum case is uh, kind of gives you a much better result. There's an extra trick which is possible in this situation. Of course, we would be happy to do that also in the uh, pure powers Hilbert cube case, but we still don't know how to do that. So, uh, I mean, these last theorems are essentially a similar framework, like um, if you know something about the set, maybe it doesn't contain an arithmetic progression. But actually, for the powers, that's a quite difficult question. I mean, uh, there are no uniform bounds like Fermat's last theorem. Uh, sorry, Fermat's theorem, there are no four progressions in the primes. Very often, there are bounds like there are no progressions in the set of size, say, logarithmically in n. So, but that's a much weaker result. And also, we don't have a, this analog on of the Guillermo dilemma. So we very often had to do something instead, so to do something similar. Um, and that occasionally just meant that the proof, you know, is not just a corollary, but needs an extra 10 pages for, for these cases. So let me just say a very few words uh, on the proof of, say, a critical lemma, or this, this uh, Somerset Crowth lemma. So it's, it's an ele elementary proof, it's short, but just it, well, that's what was the key for um, the proof. So let, let us just make a preparation. So if you, if you study these subset sums and you build them up, up iteratively, so you say at some stage you have some set, let's call it B, and you shift it again by, say in this case, case by H. So you have a set B and uh, you shift it by H. And if you now get many new elements, that's good, that's what you want. But suppose the intersection between B and b plus h is large, then you don't get many new elements, but then let's analyze what happens if the intersection between b and b plus h is, uh, say, a positive proportion of b times some constant, uh, then you can prove actually that b contains an arithmetic progression of length roughly 1 over a, uh, 1 over this density alpha. And actually what happens if you, th that's the proof, but I'm not, not reading it now li line by line, but just, it's like you you look what happens with one element. So if you shift it by h, either you get a new one that's good, or this element plus h was already contained in the old set. So you take it in the old set, but then you know you, this element is also shifted. Either you get a new one that's good, or it was already contained in the old one. And in this way, either you get lots of new elements, or you constructed a set, an element where lots of shifts by h plus h plus h are again in the set, so you constructed an arithmetic progression. So that's 
uh, a relatively simple lemma uh, which works. And then for this uh, iterative Hilbert cube, so if your Hilbert cube, say, after d steps, or uh, isn't isn't large enough, actually it must be that after you know, in one of the uh, iterative steps it was too small. So if you're if h i is the Hilbert cube after i steps, so then the step from say i to i plus one was not large enough, so it didn't have this uh, this quotient didn't have the constant c. So, but then you just look what happens to h i, which is now shifted by one element a i plus one, and you work out that here um, that increase. Uh, there are a lot too many elements at this intersection. So at that point, you would get uh, a contradiction. Uh, so you, if 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 h doesn't contain an arithmetic progression, um, you get a contradiction. So um, that's that's the proof. So on the last slide, let me just summarize. It's a topic which involves quite a few interesting things uh, in additive combinatorics, of course, uh, on some sets, on arithmetic progressions. There were excursions to Ramsey theory or even complexity theory, uh, SIF methods, character sums. Um, well, group theory could be involved, which I didn't do in this talk. Um, I mentioned, say, these uh, bombier lang conjectures, which go into arith arithmetic geometry. Um, elliptic curves are involved, a combinatoric sunflower lemma in, was, is involved. So there's lots of interesting mathematics going on, but uh, actually I'm very pleased that the final proof after all these excursions, the final proof of the say, case of squares with log log n is quite short if you, because you can avoid many of the uh, excursions into other areas. Thank you very much. <laughs>